All right, so we're recording, guys. Uh, so today we have uh, Jack Roberts, uh, a men's assistant at St. Louis University. Uh, we've got returning Emmett Rutkowski, the head coach at Stetson University. And we've got Drew Crawford, who's an assistant at Yale um, in the Ivy League. So I think you're our first Ivy Leaguer on here. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting for us. Um, so yeah, welcome, Drew. Uh, appreciate Morning, guys. you. Thank you. I appreciate you, all you guys joining us. But, um, so yeah, just, it, it's, I don't know, I know Emmett's been on before, but Jack and Drew, what we're trying to do here is just provide as much insight into the process of getting recruited as we can for, uh, high school age student athletes out there. And, you know, as you guys know, it can be a pretty overwhelming, daunting process to, you know, talk to college coaches, get noticed first and depending on where you play and that sort of thing. So just wanted to try to, we're just trying to provide some insights into that process to make it feel like these kids have somebody providing a little mentorship for them um, if they don't, can't find it anywhere else. Um, so you guys are getting ready to start your preseasons. It's uh, first of August when we're recording this, and all you guys are Division One. And um, I was just talking to Jack before we started recording. You guys report like in less than a week, right? Um, so maybe you guys, you know, one by one, provide a little bit of um, just information as to what you guys have told your incoming players um, as far as where they should be fitness wise and, you know, what they should have been doing over the summer um, and that sort of thing and how you, you know, what your expectations of them are as they report to camp um, in the beginning. Jack, you want to go hit it first? Yeah. So for us, we have, um, we have a lot of different players doing different things in the summer. So we'll have some that are, maybe playing with a summer team throughout the entire summer, some who are maybe just playing for a little bit of the summer or or a few who are not playing at all. So it looks different for, for each guy. But as far as returning um, and obviously being in shape to return, pre-season is such a short period of time. It really, we're talking from the date you report to your first real game, you're probably thinking only two weeks. So it's a case of making sure you do come in sort of almost as close to game game ready as you can be. Um, and obviously, we're fortunate that we have a pretty experienced group and, and a lot of returners. So they, they know the expectations. So for them, one of the big things is making sure that incoming guys know the expectations too. Um, but yeah, the, the biggest thing is probably being as close to game ready um, and healthy as possible when they report back. Yeah, Drew, what are you guys uh, telling your guys? Well, we actually have to start about nine, ten days later than uh, the rest of Division One, as uh, Ivy League rule, which which doesn't necessarily make it any easier on us because we've still got to play the same amount of games in the same exact time period. And then this year we've got a uh, new Ivy League tournament added in as well. But we're still going to ask for the same types of things. Our guys know exactly what to expect in terms of fitness tests, uh, whether it's a track test, whether it's a yo-yo test, um, the guys all know and that's that standard's been set uh, as we periodically take those types of tests throughout the years, check in, see where guys are at. But absolutely the the first thing they'll have to do to even, you know, make a, a travel a travel roster is to, to pass that test. Yeah. For, first, Scott, thank, thanks a lot for having us on here. It's It's really cool to see Jack and Drew on here He's at Stetson as well um, and see how well they've done in their careers in a short period of time. So I'm excited about uh, doing a podcast with them. I think this is the first time I've done it with guys that we've all worked together. Drew, Drew Jack and I worked together for about a month. So I think it was a month or two <laughs> when all three of us were together. Uh, there was some movement. But um, so I thought Jack and Drew made some pretty – Good points. If someone figures out how to do fitness testing in preseason with our schedule in men's soccer, uh, I'd be totally open to hearing it because, you know, 
Jack might remember in our first year here at Stetson, I, I don't even know if we did a fitness test. And then we decided this year we are doing a fitness test. Um, it's really difficult because you have so few days. We play an opponent on August 11th. And so that's three days in. Some coaches don't like as many preseason. I, I, at Stetson, we really like it because we only play our, our possible starting group 30 minutes. So I really like building up minutes uh, and playing a few games early on. It's just my preference. But it, it's really difficult because that first morning you have that session, and we do a beep test now, but you can't – really do a ton for them to recover quickly enough, you know, in the next day or two. So it's funny, we, we've kind of gone two different paths on it. And I think it's still evolving. But we have like Jack said at SLU, uh, it sounded like they have a really old group returning. Uh, this group is really old that we have uh, every I think the youngest guy possibly on our starting 11 is uh, 21 years old. So uh you know, a lot of these guys, Drew and Jack, rec helped recruit. So they're all becoming near seniors and grad players. So they, there's a level of expectation of where they come in fitness-wise, where they need to be. There's also a level of expectation of the incoming guys of what their role is. And the key is how do you align those two? Yeah. Um, I kind of jumped ahead. I apologize. Um, it would be good to get, especially Jack and Drew, since you haven't been on before, but uh, maybe start with Jack, like give a little bit of your background and um, we all talk funny to you. So um, you're obviously, you know, from somewhere else and um, had a different way of coming up in the soccer system and then how you ended up in the U.S. and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I, um, I'm i from Leicester in England. I played within within the academy system in England for pretty much most of the time I can remember in terms of playing. Um, and then I was actually recruited to come to to college back in back when I was 18. Uh, but at the time I decided not to come. So uh, the now head coach at Missouri State University asked me if I wanted to come out to the US. At the time, I didn't feel like I was ready to do it. Um, and then two years later, I I contacted him and said, hey, is there any chance of uh, it coming out? So that was my kind of pathway to come into the U.S. Um, and then I've, I've played four years at Missouri State um, and then I've been coaching at a few different spots over the last few years. And uh, my I met my now wife, who's from St. Louis, and uh, we, we recently moved back uh, when I took the job at St. Louis University. Cool. Uh, Drew, go ahead. Yeah, and then for me, um, yeah, the Stetson circa January 2022, um, the, the three of us were together, um, a, a short but good time. So I was that, that was my previous school um, before I got the call from Yale last summer, uh, and then we Jack Jack and I also have a you know a shared relationship with Missouri State because I was at Missouri State for for a season um, as well before that, and then um, uh, Akron for that for me. So Akron is got my undergrad there, got my postgrad there uh, and I work there. So I'm a, I'm a triple zip through and through. Were you there when, uh, were you there when they won national title or? Yeah, so I would have been a, I would have been a student. That was like, yeah. Oh, nine, 2010. Yeah. That was like my junior, senior year. Yeah. Cool. Um, awesome. And then Emmett, we already know your background. You're like Virginia guy and Culpepper and Mary Wash and, <laughs> You know, all that stuff. There you uh, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that, guys. Um, so maybe let's talk about um, – we were talking before we started recording, Drew, the, about ID camps. And um, maybe from an Ivy perspective, um, talk about ID camps and maybe just the differences that you guys have to hold kids, the standards – and the differences that you guys have to hold kids to and, you know, what it takes to get recruited by an Ivy league school and then to gain admittance, um, in, into the school. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing for us is that the timeline is shifted ahead roughly six plus months earlier. So I, so the ID camps are going to be that much more important that we see you, 
um, ahead of time as early as possible. Um, there's only going to be so many guys that are going to get the call on June 15th that, uh, you know, like, we're going to we're going to we're going to come to you otherwise players are going to have to think about how do they find the other schools how do they come to the other how do they come to the school it's not going to be the other way around so we'll have those types of guys picked out and a number of 50 60 guys that might get a call that first a couple of weeks that we can reach out in june um, because we'll know ahead of players other time maybe it, from showcases they've been to a camp previously before that so camps can be super helpful on that end for, for us and Ivy, Ivy league specific, I would say, but you know, the, at, at Stetson, we'd be able to get in a guy up through summer, you know, talk about June, July of his senior year in high school, whereas our last moment that we can possibly enroll a guy uh, for most Ivy leagues, probably gonna be January, maybe February. So oh, there's, there's a couple months. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch that's just completely ruled out there. So, you know, if you show up to ID camp at Yale and it's winter of your senior year, like we're probably already done with that class. So there's really no point in you. Uh, you're just late to the party there at that point. So um, but but yeah, ID camps are super important for us because there's a lot of guys maybe coming out from the West Coast. We have a lot of internationals. I remember at our, our last camp specifically, we had 28 different states represented and, and like seven different countries. But I think that's pretty standard for us because that's the type of pool that we're we're bringing in that that diversity. Um, so that's just yeah, those are the types of people you're you're up against a lot of different competition from from different areas. Yeah, and Jack, you were at Brown, much the same there. Yeah, yeah, probably um, probably very similar to be honest. Yeah, and uh, I know I know that a lot of kids would actually combine if they, they would often go to. Yale's camp on Saturday and Brown's camp on Sunday and that they, they would try and obviously one of the, the one of the cool things about that region is everything's pretty close relatively speaking um, so that was always a good thing that we found was there was ways to we could have a camp and Yale could have a camp and you'd get some of the same uh, same players attending both yeah um, so talk a little bit about just the standards exactly. yeah go ahead Emmett sorry and I'd, I'd add to that what um, Drew and, and Jack, I, there's like the positive parts of the ID camp. I also think the pressure of a parent thinking that their son should go to a certain school and having those expectations, what's great about ID camps is that you also learn as a prospective student athlete of whether you actually want to play at this level, whether you can handle it when you're at these camps, because if you get to a camp and let's say you go to Stetson day one, Yale day two, Brown day three, SLU day four, uh, you might have a different experience at each one and how they're all run, how they do things. And there's no right or wrong. It just might be a personal preference. So I think you have to be careful of overdoing it. But it's also great because some of these prospective student athletes think they know the school they want. And what happens is they go to a different school and they fall in love with it. That happens a lot as well. And, and they never thought they'd look at that school. So I think it's very important going through that process and being able to see the differences on how the programs are run. Uh, because there's totally different aspects of each school. Right. Um, Drew, I mean from an Ivy perspective, like how does a kid even know if he's or she, I guess, um, are, are going to be eligible for admittance from an academic standpoint? Because is it, is it true that there's no real help from an admission standpoint that you guys can get from an athletic side? Um, is that true? And then there's no scholarship. There's no athletic scholarships true as well. Right. Yeah, outside of our six supported spots, there's absolutely nothing we can do um, for, for players beyond that. Like, we'll still want to have conversations, and, and that would be, you know, a recruited walk-on because even beyond that six spots, that's that means we're only putting together a roster of 24. That's still a little bit small for us. So we'll still have, you know, a guy or two every year that, that get in on their own that we've been recruiting, and they've been in the process with us. So... Um, we'll still definitely try and get those, but yeah, that, that means that the, even more so 
that the pressure is going to be on them to be able to put together that um, application really well and uh, and still be able to get into school. And then Jack, from your standpoint, uh, you guys are super competitive um, D1 program that, you know, looks to win conference championships and stuff like that. So, and you guys recruit on a national and an international um, basis. So, um, talk Number about one kind of recruiting the class in the, in the country there, Scott. Was it really? Yeah. Um, so big expectations this year, huh? Um, and then, you know, talk about like using the portal and, um, you know, international and then from a national standpoint, yeah. what your guys kind of overall strategy is. Yeah, I think um, at St. Louis, a little more so. If you look at the roster, it's, it's, it's fairly heavily domestic, um, especially just now with the general with the general landscape of college soccer. If you look at a lot of rosters, there's probably more more international players than we have. Um, but one thing that is evident pretty much everywhere is, as you said, the transfer portal. So. Our incoming class this year is a combination of true freshmen um, and domestic players, and that is a little bit from all over the country, um, but for the most part, the Midwest region. Um, So for us, it's domestic and then a mix of a few transfer students, and that's kind of, that's this year. And then next year, I would imagine it actually to be probably similar um, and maybe actually fewer transfer students as as the effect of COVID starts to wear off a little bit and you get back to pretty much typical um, typical recruiting classes and recruiting cycles. But yeah, for us, it's, it's a lot more domestic based and um, we're fortunate actually that obviously in St. Louis, there's a lot of very good players. And then in this region, one of the big things for us is trying to get the best players in the region and figure out a way to keep them here. So that's, that's a big part of, of what we do. So, Kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, we talk about you guys have been around, you know, you've been to different schools. Um, talk about some of the common characteristics that kids have that have been successful and help them kind of flourish as a college athlete, um, college student athlete for that matter. Um, Drew, maybe actually Emmett, um, you haven't talked in a while, so uh, I'll give you a shot at this one to start off with. But you know, just what are some of the the things that you have found that each kid possesses kind of in common um, with each other that have been successful in your career? Of like the current players coming in and then as they graduate, do you mean? Well, I mean, so, you know, just over time, you know, what are some of the, the common character, characteristics that kids have possessed that have led to their success? has to be that there's obviously a standard of of talent right you have to have a standard at all three of our levels where we're at even though they're they can be different um there has to be a standard i think how you define that we us three could probably all have some different definitions i think number two right away is mentality and you go back to I'm sure Jack and I could sit here and tell you a ton of stories about that first year when we took over Stetson and we had 24 freshmen on a program with the sixth head coach in seven years. And there hadn't been, um, you know, the, the program just had gone through a lot of different transitions. So we had to do a lot of developing and we were, we had players that were really talented, but didn't have the mentality. We had some guys that might not have been at the standard for the level of play, but they actually had the mentality. And what happens is, you know, I could, there's plenty of guys that I thought would be really good players and have a chance to play at the next level, but they didn't last for a year or two. You know, they, they were gone. And so you have to have players that possess not just the standard, but the mentality and that they have that growth mindset of, all right, how do I manage my time right away in college for the academic part? And then how do I manage my time to get better at my craft uh, with soccer? And I know that sounds somewhat basic, but I think if you can do those, 
you're going to be generally uh, pretty successful. There's a really good chance to be successful. Yeah, Drew, I mean, not that these aren't good schools, St. Louis and Stetson, but you, you're dealing with a different kind of a different level. So, you know, what are how are kids different in your mind that end up at your program at Yale? Yeah, no, I think I think Emma answered it really well um, from yeah from from that standpoint. We're not looking for a whole lot of other things. I think that our types of guys are going to be really proactive in the process. Um, they're obviously going to need to be yeah handle that 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 work versus ba- you know balance um, on the field training works family school all those pieces going to have to be able to make a lot of sacrifices even before they get to college because when you get to college you're still expected to be a a full time basically a full time job to be able to handle the the soccer the athletics load with the academics load in any school you get to is going to be is going to be a handful so the guys are going to have to come in with those types of skills before they come in. I think, yeah, unbelievably hardworking when you're talking about making sure that they're able to perform and leave lasting impressions on the field um, from, from a work rate standpoint, a talent standpoint, you know, at, at camps uh, and certain instances where we can work with players more individually we get to know them a little bit better we get to see how they react to adversity we get to see what are their training habits we get to see um all these all these details that we probably pick up on a lot more closer than we would just sitting on the corner of a field watching a showcase game which is a you know one out of a hundred games that take place in a single day um, and we we're bouncing around and we're probably staying at a field maybe for a half of a game before we got to move on to the next one. So, um, so yeah, so there's, there's definitely good opportunities to, to learn about things about guys, whether it's a phone call, whether it's working with them, um, on the field in that sort of, in that type of environment, when we're allowed, um, we're definitely looking to pick up a lot of those things that you're not necessarily putting together, putting out there as your, as you know, as your, as your first face, but kind of like what's, what's under that, that level right there what's under the surface level, because we still want to, we want to uh, recruit the best people as well. The best people, you know, your, your parents, your family, like they're going to play a big role in the recruiting process as well. When you come on, uh, on a visit to some places. So, um, so yeah, no, we're, we're looking definitely to what's, what's below that surface level. Who are you as a person? We're going to try and figure out how committed are you to to the process, to, to keeping your grades up, to, you know, maybe we need to tell you, hey, you're going to have to up this SAT score. You're going to have to try and take the ACT another time and, and push that score. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to definitely see how, how we can push you. And, um, yeah, I, I, Emmett, was, it was a really good answer because we're just looking for that baseline of are you a, are you a good person? What is your mentality? Um, can we recruit you? solely based on will you be a fit into our, our culture yeah um jack you have anything to add to that no i think these two i think these two nailed it really yeah so emmett you and jack go back to when you know when you first started at stetson and you said you had 24 freshmen literally 24 freshmen yeah yeah that was <laughs> that was a lot to manage. We, we were uh, we were going through some bumps and bruises. If you go back, yeah. I think well, did we start Jack? Was it o five and one or o four and one? And then we really, you know, we beat two top twenty five teams that year. Yeah, uh, we exactly. we had a really solid year. Uh, but but what was what, what did we start Jack that season? I don't know. I stopped, I stopped counting. <laughs> It was tough because we did the spring COVID season, which was uh, also a little bit of a nightmare for us at Stetson because all that current freshmen became freshmen the next year. So like we we weren't great in that COVID year. And then in 21, we started really slow, but it really came together. We, 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 had, we went on a six or seven game winning streak, ended really well. But uh, I think part of it, and I'm so thankful, you know, Jack was here. Um, and then Justin and Nate were the other two assistants. We were able to be, you have to be stable and have a good 
good mindset with young players because it can be pretty volatile when you have a young team, which is the opposite of what we're going into at Stetson this year. The team's very old. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe walk through that process and kind of identifying who you had, you know, from a not only talent, but kind of a mentality, you know, you, you meet that much, you know, that many defeats. It, it can beat some beat some people down and, and kind of change your mentality. How did you kind of coach against that and, you know, keep guys positive? So I think a huge part is when you're really building a program at a place like Stetson, which is a, a mid-major school, you, you have to have the culture first. And although that sounds like a cliche, guys, when we start losing, we have to have the right mentality. It has to still be a growth mindset, even though the sport is about results at this level. So that can be, it sounds pretty easy, but it can be really frustrating. So, you know, you talk to, and I'm sure Jack could add to this, uh, but, you know, there's specific times where we lost to JU that year. Uh, I think it was three nothing. To not, you know, we lost to him three times in that spring COVID season. And uh, part of it was us being really young. We're also coming out of being in uh, isolation for 10 days and then playing a game two days later. Uh, and that, and that was a, it's a growth experience for me as my first time as a head coach in division one. But what I thought that did is we had the culture, right. And that because we went through some of those experiences it set us up for the fall. So when we did get, you know, punched in the face and early on in the fall in 21, we responded the right way. And that's what I'm really proud about. Um, you know, we, we had some tough games early on, but we were really close and you could see it was coming. And then as we hit our stride, you know, that's what makes it so enjoyable. It's, it's always hard when you're building a program, you just got to stick to what you believe in. And you got to stick to the players that who you recruit. And Jack and Drew have just proven to obviously recruit high character players with the right mentality. And then do some of these players have room to develop at a place like Stetson? That that's a huge question, right? Because maybe they could develop at a different school, but Stetson's a a, a unique school at, on its own in Florida, especially. So it's a tricky. It can be a tricky place to recruit. Um, a player we recruit at Stetson might be set up for more success or less success compared to UNF, which is a state school in Jacksonville, if that makes sense. There's no right or wrong. It's just how, how do we find the right fit here? Um, and, and, and so I think both these two did a great job of that while being here because once you hit that, that tough part in the season, it's how you respond. You need that culture to be really strong. So guys see, Hey, we're really close to, to starting to turn these, you know, a draw or a close loss into wins. Yeah, Jack. So when you're out on the recruiting trail, so to speak, I mean, how do you identify those characteristics and, you know, what do you, aside from talent, what are you looking for um, kind of intangible kind of stuff that, that stands out to you? Yeah, I think um, as much as you can, you want to try and see, some personality traits in a player's while they're on the field, but mm -hmm. but obviously that's difficult. So you can you can watch a player and think, man, I love this. I love all of the things he does. I love the way he behaves. I love the way he carries himself. And then you could speak to him in person and that not be the case. So that's uh, that's something that you have to probably you do have to develop a relationship and and get an understanding of each other. And like Emmett said, figure out if the player fits your program or if your program fits the player and all of those things as well. But as far as like just watching a game, um, I think it's really important to know what, know what we need as a, as a team and as a program um, don't sort of over recruit and have five players in the same position and no players in a different position. Make sure that we, we recruit our needs and um, set, set ourselves up as a team set ourselves up for success but again try and set up an individual for success and even if it's we recruit someone with with the thought that maybe they won't play for the first 
one or two or three years. Hopefully at some point there's a pathway for them. Um, and I think that's a really important part of, of the recruiting process as well is figuring out a pathway. And if, if someone obviously proves you wrong in a good way and they, they play earlier than you anticipate, then that's great. But at least trying to see if there's a, a pathway for someone into the team. Um, but yeah, personality is a, is a huge thing. And both of these two have touched on it a lot. But I think you can see some of those things on a field, like how do they react to something going against them? How do they how do they behave with their teammates? How are they in terms of, are they a leader and all of those types of things? But a, a huge part of the recruiting process is actually building a relationship and getting to know one another and seeing if it's a, if it's a person that you want to work with, because you're with, you're with each other all the time. You spend so much time together and you spend so much time with the team and so much time around each other that you have to be around good people. Cause otherwise it's a, it's a long old stretch. Yeah, Scott. Uh, Scott yeah, yeah, a, go. good, a good example that to go on what Jack said. I'll give a specific example. Maybe this will help. Is Jack talked about you bring in players too that might impact right away, or that might take a few years. Uh, we deal with that obviously at Stetson, but I'll give you a specific example. Duncan McGuire won the Mac Herman Trophy this past year. Uh, I believe he redshirted his first year. He walked on at Creighton and redshirted and then developed. We played Orlando City this past uh, spring, and Duncan McGuire was you know, drafted. He actually scored the first goal in the game. It was a really impressive uh, 1v1 goal that he, that he did. I was like, you know, I'm really excited to follow him just because of his story at Creighton and how he was obviously patient in his development. And then anyone who's watching the MLS right now, Duncan McGuire, I, I believe now has, um, counting League Cup and the regular season, he's over 10 goals. He's one of the main reasons why Orlando City's that successful. And also, he has the, I think he leads the league in minutes, uh, goals per minutes played this year in the MLS as a rookie. So, you know, those are examples of everyone's paths different too in their development. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen that have kind of turned you off and, and said, uh, I'm not interested in this kid anymore? Um, Drew, maybe kind of what are some of the things that you've seen that, you know, not just at Yale, but anywhere that, you know, Chris Norris has been on here and said, someone's always watching. So, you know, what are some of the behaviors that you've seen that, that are a no go for you guys? Yeah, no, correct. Um, yeah, some someone's yeah. You always have to feel like somebody somebody's watching, somebody's evaluating you for something. Whether you're on the field, you're off the field. Um, you know, maybe a, a lack of defending work rate you know, it could be toughness. Seeing seeing guys uh, game style gameplay change because they're arguing with a referee or a back and forth with a coach, a teammate. Uh, stuff off the field, maybe showing up just before the whistle blows for practice or the, you know, they're arriving late, making excuses, those, those sorts of things. It's, it's, um, but I think for me separately, kind of going back to the last one, like I can like a player all I want. Um, but until I have that team brochure or I have a player's GPA test scores in front of me as well, it's hard for it's. It, that kind of defines the direction that I need to take with a lot of the, with a lot of our recruiting with a lot of our players will be academic first based a lot of times to see is this conversation worth my time because is he is he going to be able to get admitted into school so um, so that's that's also going to be a piece of it as well. I mean, I was just I was also thinking um, you talking about uh, the guy at Orlando City from Creighton. Um, what do you think got him over the hump, you know, from his, from being recruited or not necessarily recruited, but being a walk on. And I don't know what that story was there, but uh, red shirting and then becoming the player that he did, you know, what, have you heard anything about what his habits were and, and what he did to, to grow into that player? I actually, after he played against us, you know, I wasn't familiar with his story until after he scored. Obviously, I knew who he was. I, maybe Drew Jack knows. Uh, was it over twenty goals this past year? I think I think he scored. Um, and and so, 
I started reading about his story and um, I, I don't know him personally or anything like that. Uh, but obviously you have to have a, a really good mentality to be a guy that's sitting obviously at a really top program, but uh, I believe his trajectory was, you know, it was really slow and then it really took off. And so, you know, we have an example like that at Stetson we've talked about in recruiting where we've taken guys that actually have maybe had um, a problem at another university or two and haven't panned out. And we've been a really good place where they kind of come and I wouldn't say rehabilitate their image, but basically they get here and it's an environment where it's their, their last chance and they've really done well. We have three or four guys that uh, I, I project to possibly be starting for us. And they were all guys that were afterthoughts, one being actually from Virginia. And um, I mean, it, it's really neat when you see some of these players really turn it on. Maybe they weren't in the right environment for them. But as they bought into the culture and bought in, you really get to see him develop as a player. I think what's even more fascinating is to see him develop as a person too. Because, uh, you know, we, we have a player I, I talked to Jack about that's, one, you know, possible, could play at the next level. And when Jack was here, he was probably in our bottom five uh, on, on our roster. And so there's just – the reason those are stories is because you don't hear about it all the time, but – it's really neat to see guys that go through that because obviously Jack and Drew were integral in our process at Stetson, but developing not just the player, but the person. And that's probably why they have maybe an opportunity to play at the next level. Maybe delve into a couple of the stories as to why they were kind of an afterthought or ended up with you and, and what they needed to rehabilitate, so to speak. And then, you know, how they've since grown into becoming assets to your side there. Sure. The, I think it's might be, first of all, a coaching change at a school. When a coaching change happens, you have different philosophies, different systems in play. Um, I think some players want to sometimes, prospective student athletes want to go to maybe the place that their parents or that their club expects them to go. Every kid wants to play pro, but then they want to say, hey, I want to go power five and sometimes that might not be the best place for that individual um, and so things happen where a player can go somewhere and then they're probably not as both these guys have already talked about it's probably not the best individualized situation for that player even though it's a you know it's a team game so when we take a player you know we're in florida that might be in Florida uh, and went to a, a, a really big school and it didn't work out, it, it's not because the player might have a bad attitude or something like that. It just might not be the right fit for them. In the case of a player from Virginia, uh, I, you know, my background is I have a lot of contacts there, uh, a lot of people I know in the, in the youth game. So, you know, this player in particular, I recruited seven years ago at a uh, camp you know, he ended up at a, at a big South school and didn't really even play that much. It just wasn't the right fit for him. They went under a coaching change and he came here and actually, you know, ha had some problems early on. And then, you know, he's, he's now a, like a leader on our team. So um, I think going through when you have guys and leaders on your team that are reiterating what the coach wants, you're going to develop those players that are a little bit on the fence. Um, and so that, that, that's probably, hopefully that answers your question, but th there's a lot of different specific examples you go into with these guys where coaching change, style, play, team culture, you know, you might love the coach, but not like the players on the team. That could be tough too. Seems like, seems like kids, and, and I'm not going to stereotype this, but I would probably guess more guys than girls kind of get soccer blinders on and all they care about is you know, I, I got to make a post on Instagram that I've, I've signed with a team and, and, you know, I'm going to wherever and, and not even really thinking about, is this the best situation for me overall, you know, without soccer? Um, and so I think that it's important 
we've talked about it a lot on here, like finding the right spot, even if you were to remove soccer. Um, you know, Jack, maybe you can talk a little bit about like kids you've observed that, you know, had soccer taken away and, and you've seen both sides, like they, they still thrived even though they weren't, didn't have soccer and maybe kids who realized they were in the wrong spot um, without soccer in their lives, so to speak. Yeah, we had, a, I remember my college roommate um, at Missouri State, so when I was a player, he first two years didn't play at all um didn't probably particularly enjoy by the end of it probably wasn't enjoying even practice too much um and he he just stopped playing and that was obviously after some conversations but he stopped playing but carried on as a student at missouri state and loved being a student there and um absolutely that was the right school for him and the right place for him even without without soccer but there are like you said there's so many examples of the the opposite where it's it's only about that. Um, and I was, I've was i actually worked at NAIA um, and Division 2 as well. And I think you actually find some some guys at those levels who 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 do find the right balance and for them personally and probably would admit or be happy to say that they wouldn't be a great Division 1 player or they weren't as committed as they needed to be to be a Division 1 player or whatever it is. But I think, um, I think there's definitely... Definitely a lot to be said of finding the right school, um, and then obviously you can't say that the soccer is just a small a small piece because it is a big piece and it's a huge commitment if you're going to do it. But um, I think that's the part where you have to figure out how much do you how much are you even without ability and without which level you could play at how much are you willing to sort of sacrifice and actually commit while you're while you're in college to actually playing because that's obviously it is a huge commitment. Drew, you have anything to add to that? I know that's kind of maybe been exhausted, but um, you know, anything to add from kind of your level and in your school perspective? Yeah, no, I think I think as we we've kind of alluded to, like being a fit in the culture is is going to be massive. It's like, and, and it might be you know character based recruiting from the get go. And I look, you know, you can take, use a case story at Stanford, IU, Akron, probably SLU, like those guys have an unbelievable culture that you have to go in and you have to fit in. Um, and they'll do their, obviously their, their research and the, the background check before they get there. But also that's going to be on the player when they get to those programs. Are you, are they doing what they can to fit in? Um, because if you do, then you'll probably be successful and you'll help to the growth and and uh, the success of that program. But then if you don't, then you're more likely just going to be another name on the transfer portal. So there's right now, I, there's a lot of guys on the transfer portal, maybe even moving multiple times. Like for our, for, for my sake, uh, Yale specifically, we're, we it's harder to transfer into Yale than it is to show up at Yale as an 18-year-old freshman. So that's probably not going to be a, a path for us. So don't expect that to, to, to work out. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think, and then you, you go through all the levels, division two, II, division three, there's going to be schools that do a great job of that, that are consistently competing at the tops of their leagues, their conferences, and at the top of the whole division um, as well. But that'll just speak so that the coaches and the strong cultures that they bring guys in assimilate them and then continue to be successful um, and guys that have a growth mindset come in and develop over those years over the time even if they're not able to come in and play right away are they targeting you know maybe spring of sophomore year to make that jump or junior year to finally make the jump so it's those guys that show that type of determination and uh, ability to to stay on on the timeline, um, those guys will be be resilient mentally, physically. Uh, those those ones will be the ones that will more likely be able to be a fit at that individual program. Or then maybe you need to, to try and find a, another place, perhaps drop down a level, drop down a division, um, go someplace back closer to home, whatever, if, if you're thinking about transferring, like you need to think about what you need to reevaluate what, what's, what's important to you. Emma, you have anything to add? That was really good by those guys. Yeah. 
No, it was very good. So, you know, you guys touch on, everybody kind of has brought up culture and uh, Jack, you and Drew both have been part of helping Emmett build his culture. Um, maybe talk uh, Jack first, like what Emmett has done from a leadership standpoint in developing a culture and, um, you know, what you've observed and, and what worked and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think you don't that, work for him anymore, so you don't have to like totally brown. Yeah, I'll him. just talk really, really badly about him. Uh, <laughs> no, I think at the start there were to be to be honest. So I, again, I played and coached at Missouri State, where it had been the same head coach for twenty five years and the same associate head coach at the time for eleven years. So there was an incredible amount of stability there, and an incredible amount of obviously leadership. But then at the point where the the locker room led itself and the players led themselves and all those things. And the, the coaches were more there just to reaffirm things um, and obviously step in when they needed to. I think at the time when, when Emmett and I were at Stetson at the very start, it was probably the complete opposite of that, where there was, there was no, through no fault of the players or anything, there was no established culture. There wasn't even really an established group of players who had been together even for, even for a year or two. Um, and, and obviously at other places, it's four years, five years, and, and it's relatively consistent after time. So I think at the, at the start, I remember one of the big things that, I mean, we, we obviously had players coming in and out all the time. And even among those freshmen that we had come in, not, not a vast majority of them made it all the way through the two years and three years and four years, because it, it was a period of so much transition and, figuring things out and the, the individuals figuring things out as well. Um, but I think one of the big things that Emmett did and had with the players was just a lot of patience. And uh, when he was talking about when we were losing games, I remember the during the spring season when we were losing games, it was like, man, I don't, I don't know if we're ever going to win it, win a game. That's kind of how it felt that spring, that spring. And Emmett would kind of say to us as a staff and to the team, like, we just got a, it's going to it's going to come and like it's going to take time and i know people say now trust the trust the process and things like that but in that in that scenario at that point we really did just have to kind of just take the results for what they were and and know that it wasn't going to be great results and then that fall i think the first fall where it started to you started to kind of feel like there was a bit of a culture being established was at the start we were losing games but we probably weren't always deserving to lose the games um and then it felt with a bit of time like, oh, this is a, I think the players started to basically see like there was a bit of a culture and there was a a, a long-term plan of this is going to happen sometimes. You're not going to get all the results you wanted. And then I remember the game we won. It was um, away at, the first game we really won was away at Lipscomb. Um, and it went to, it went to overtime. Um, we were winning the game in regular time. And then we made a, a little mistake and we it felt like we always made mistakes at that time. Um, and they tied the game up and then it went to overtime and we were just thinking, I'm sure on the bench we were thinking, man, we're going to lose this game because that felt like it was the story of it all, all the time. Um, but we actually won it and we got a bit of luck. I remember we got a bit of luck on the winning goal and we won the game. And it, but that, that sort of moment, and I'm sure it happens in programs and at different points, but that moment, I think, for all the players, like everyone was, it was a it was a regular season conference game, and you probably would have thought we'd won the World Cup or something the, the way everyone reacted, but it it was definitely a big moment in terms of all the hard work and the patience that Emmett had sort of preached. That yeah, there is actually going to be some that some good moments that come along with the uh, with a lot of the with a lot of the hard work, but also some of the tough moments as well. So that on the culture side, that was it was interesting being part of that where. It, kind of was really starting at the absolute first step um, and seeing seeing some of the patience that's needed. And, and obviously with young people as well, it's tough when you you want to win. Like everyone hopefully wants to win and has that element. So for, for some of those young guys to feel like they're never going to win a game is not a, not an easy position to be in. Hey, Drew, you have anything to add? You came after with a little bit of overlap with Jack. Um, you know, what were your observations that was what was working and then you know, maybe Emmett can talk about what didn't work. Of course. Yeah, no, I think Emmett did a great job of just kind of 
providing the framework and the direction of the program. Um, and that obviously started with us recruiting certain types of guys that were a fit for what, what we wanted to do with that, whether it, characteristically, you know, where they come from, did they, did they really want to be at Stetson? Were they willing to, you know, look at Stetson and commit to being a, being a hatter uh, through and through. So, you know, that, that level of commitment, but then also as guys get in, you're talking about develop them, developing them off the field. So I think we had a lot of maturity. We had a lot of growing pains. We, so patience was a huge key of that, but also we had to just keep our eyes in front and, and not be thinking about like the past too much, not be thinking about the, t the future too much. It was like, can you stay in the present to make yourself better in the future, every step of the way. And, and I think a, a period of time when I was there as well, specifically was we were still lacking um, in leadership. So we were trying to develop a few guys on the field, off the field, give them ways to, to be a better, give them a platform so that they could grow into a captain type role um, and promote like a leadership group of maybe three to five guys who were, you know, had the trust of the team, who were continuing to find their voice within the team. Um, but then, and then also that helps create the, the culture and the snowball and the, the players that kind of move that forward themselves like Jack. Yeah. So what's great about Drew and Jack is their backgrounds are completely different. They've been, they were at, some of the most successful programs and I, and at Mercer, I was the assistant and we, we went to NCAAs, but Drew, Drew and Jack were at uh, programs that advanced in NCAAs as coaches. And uh, it was very established. I, I, I was a head coach at a division three level. So, uh, you know, I was having to mow my own field, aerate it. I took over a program that was like one in 18. I think they had eight goals and 70 against. So, I learned a lot with patience there, which if someone's coming from a a background where you got to develop it, I could see it being really hard. I think it's a lot easier said than done to go through it, but there's a few examples. I'll touch on two of them. Tactics. Well, we made a lot. I, I, I personally made just mistakes sometimes trying to find out how you play and what our style is. And someone can try to define that early on, but you don't truly know until it's embedded in the team and your culture. So we played UCF and Jack and I, we, we were there and um, in preseason and we lost seven to one. Um, you know, we were kind of a laughing stock, you know, you, you, you know, people were just like, man, that, that's a bad Stetson team. Um, we obviously rebounded to beat, top 75 RPI in the first year, eight, seven and two record beating top the same year we beat Lipscomb <laughs> that Jack talked about. So what that did is I wasn't, we weren't afraid as a staff to, to, to make massive mistakes and then try to learn from them. Um, it, it, I'll tell you what, the day after doesn't feel good at all, but it, it does reset things. This past year we played FIU my assistant Jaime, um, he comes from a background at UNCG and SMU, so similar to Jack and Drew on uh, again. And we lost seven nothing to FIU in a preseason game. We had a you know a strong season last year as well. So for for Stetson, so you know he had told me after the game he's never lost a game in his career, playing career, coaching career that bad. So we we did some tactics that obviously didn't work. And, you know, we didn't go about it that way. That That's tactics. When Drew and Jack were still on staff that spring, something we touched on is we went and played Daytona State and St. Leo, one of the best JUCOs and a really strong D2. And we were, we were, we didn't deserve to tie or to draw or to win either of the matches for Daytona State or St. Leo. We had some serious, just some discipline problems. Um, some current players just not acting the way they, they should. And after the game, we're at Chipotle and, you know, we're getting drinks and, uh, you know, we always do water cups and stuff. And I see a couple guys getting random stuff, things like that. And it was a specific example of like, you know, we reiterate in our culture, like 
for example, when we go to eat, you're getting water cups, uh, you know, that you, you don't go somewhere and go get like a soda out of the thing for getting water cups. When you're at a grocery store, when you take your shopping cart, are you putting it back where it's supposed to go? Or do you leave it in that parking space? These like basic skills that a lot of people might be like, well, that's normal. But for some of these players from so many different cultures, they don't they don't know that and how to zone in on it. And those were the things we were dealing with that are specific examples of like that to me, how you deal with a shopping cart sounds a little bit ridiculous, but that can like define a person for me. If you are that lazy that you can't go put it back, I don't really want you in our program. That's just, that's just a, that's a non-negotiable. So we go over that with our teams. And what I was lucky with is you have guys like Drew, Jack, Jaime, Nate, Justin, a lot of my assistants that, have done such a good job, you know, reiterating that. And um, I think that's why we're at where we are today. Yeah. I mean, now I'm feeling awful about not taking my shopping cart back. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, it's all about integrity and, and character and that sort of thing. And that's awesome. I mean, I'm sure that all of you guys still stress that if you, I'm, I'm sure you did before, but, you know, maybe just being with Emmett and his program helped, you know, reinforce that. But uh, um, Jack, I wanted to talk a little bit about like coming up in a, in a, in an academy overseas and then, you know, the feelings you had, I don't mean to rehash maybe some bad feelings, but like, you know, coming up in Leicester and then uh, I'm making the assumption and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you, you, I've heard, from other guys, one of the guys um, we had on, he was, came up in the Liverpool system and, you know, they put them all in a room and then they brought them in each for a different meeting and you either got a contract or you didn't. And so talk about having, potentially having soccer taken away from you, you know, in that moment, you know, kind of, at, you know, what your mindset was to, to have what you loved, you know, change for you in that moment, and if, if that's in fact what happened. So... Yeah, I think it. I think to be honest, I think it, it's different for everyone and how the how the message is delivered. Um, like I was at, I was at Leicester City from um, seven till sixteen, so I I saw a lot of players coming and going. Even when you even when you're younger, you see people coming in and out. But I think when you're actually told, no matter how old you are, whether it's sixteen or twenty six, when you're actually told you're not good enough. In, in a coach's eyes or in a club's eyes or whatever, it's, it's never an easy thing to to hear. So I was at 16, I was released from Leicester and then I went to Lincoln City and then I got the same thing at Lincoln when I was 18. Um, when And it wasn't, it wasn't for me, it wasn't everyone waiting to come into the room and find out. It was kind of, I think how it is with a lot of sports, you, you get a feeling one way or the other. You start to obviously over time, you, again, you're with these people every day. So you do have a, you do have a bit of an understanding of where you're at at least. And if you think you're close um, in my situation, I, w I felt like I was pretty close. And um, so I w it wasn't until the very, very last day of the season that I was told I wouldn't get a, a new contract. Um, but I didn't really, I never really thought that that was the end of playing. I don't think I've ever had that mindset about it. I thought, um, where, where am I going to play? <laughs> How am I going to play? Where am I going to play? And all those things. Um, but I never really thought that that was just the end of it. And I think that's kind of something that the US, the US has now found a great, um, it, it's basically the only place in the world where you can combine a really, really high education with a really, really high level of playing. Um, and I think that's been for the, in some ways, for the better of college soccer in terms of just the diversity of it and bringing in so many players Um but obviously, it's that's one of the things that's so amazing about it here is that you can, you can combine, you can play at an Ivy League school, um, and have the best education in the world, um, and you can also play Division One soccer at a, a really, really, really high level, and then some of those guys even go on to be pros. So I think that's just a great example of just how high of a level of academics and how high of a level of playing you can do. Um, so I think it really it's all it's all about how you how you frame it and obviously it's disappointing and obviously for different people they take it in different ways and and are able to move on a little quicker or not move on a little little quicker but for me I I I was incredibly lucky that in college soccer in the US I found a different pathway to be able to 
continue playing, but also to open some new doors that I really hadn't explored and looked into in the past. Right. Uh, great answer. Um, so you guys, I mean, you deal with kids who, you know, let's face it, you know, not everyone is going to be welcome, you know, be recruited by your programs. So they're getting rejected and they have to kind of do what Jack did and find out where, where they're net, where they're going to play. So, um, you know, what should a recruits expectations be, um, as far as, you know, I, they email you and they don't hear back. I mean, maybe kind of talk about Drew, maybe talk about, you know, what that means, um, from, um, from a, uh, from their perspective, like a student athlete's perspective, what does it mean to not get an email back and, and what, where should that steer them? Yeah. So I think persistence is, is key, especially getting your, you know, a foot in the door. Um, it, it, if you're a 2026 or below, um, right now we're not even in a period where I can legally communicate back to you outside of, a, in the shape of a, camp email, like a camp invite type of email. So there might be a reason for that why I can't respond to you. Um, this whole month of July, I've been going from camp to camp, back and forth. Um, and uh, right now, my, my, my email is at a, as a lower level of priority compared to the where I'm recruiting or where I'm working in the moment. And then I've probably got a list of all the things I need to do to get ready for a preseason and the actual season still. And then emails are slowly slipping down that list of priorities. So there's just a time crunch and uh, my availability to address and to attend to all those matters, which is tough right now. Um, so, so yeah, no, it could be any number of things. It could be a coach is leaving and moving and going somewhere else. So you've, maybe only been speaking to one coach at a, at an institution. And now all of a sudden that person is going somewhere else. And then you've got to start, you know, maybe that process with a couple going a couple of steps backwards with another coach now um, and getting in there. So, so I think that's where it comes down to is yes. Can email be an important opening, you know, email where you're drawing attention with a highlight video, where you're presenting your academics, your transcripts for us to look at, Sure, but it, I think ultimately showing up face to face at a camp, or you know, sending that email around the time of a big ECNL MLS type showcase playoffs or whatever, where we can actually see you on the field, and maybe we we, we meet and shake hands or something in passing, you know, is always a is always a good kind of like starter as well. Um, but again, there's there's going to be limitations to what we can say during those days of events. And, and based on your age, your graduation year, what are we going to be able to to talk about up to that point? But but definitely, you know, if if a coach doesn't read your email, do you consider I've had guys that will copy and paste and send me the same thing every day. And that doesn't necessarily make me any more uh, excited to reply to it and, and read it, even though I'll see it popping up and saying the same thing. Or is it maybe wait? seven to 14 days later. And then I send, I follow up with another thing and it's got, it has different content. It's got a different video or a full game attached this time. It's got an update about a test score. So I think there's some guys that they do a good job of, of keeping it personalized, of keeping it current rather than just repetitive. Oh, Hey, look at me type, type of emails. Um, and, and those are the ones that I, obviously the more, more the more personable, the more genuine, those are the ones that I want to try and invest my time to starting that conversation or at least giving a response and and hopefully being able to give a quick assessment to that person academically or physically. Are they going to be in the ballpark? Or is it worth a conversation? Are, they could be a potential student athlete again. Emmett, you have anything to add to that one? I think Drew, Drew nailed it. You know, just you're a recruit. You need to make sure that t timing is key. Be personable to the school and to the coach. Don't make sure you have the right coach's name. Make sure you have the right school. Make sure you have the right major you're interested in. And try to 
be very good with your actual construction of that email in a concise manner with good materials. Uh, that's, that's critical. How important is it to, um, you know, keep your highlight reel updated or is it kind of just one of those things that, you know, you make one and, and you stick with that one for, for months at a time? Highlight reels are important. I think it's like a, I can see stuff. It just needs to be a highlight reel of quality opponents and games. It can't be, you know, a, a Sunday league game or you juggling around trees in your backyard. Uh, that's not going to go well. Or it's not going it, to, that's a waste of our time. Uh, so we want to see something that's competitive. And then the highlight reel is good. You know, our, our process is then we need to get 90 minute games against the best competition. So however that's defined at any level for all of us college coaches, that's, that's key. So you've actually had highlights of kids juggling around trees in their backyard. Yeah. When I was over in Louisiana, uh, I had some interesting emails come through. Uh, I think I had one where the goalkeeper was using two trees as the goalpost. So (laughs) playing against alligators. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're well over an hour. I want to be respectful of you guys' time. Um, do you have uh, – what have I missed? You know, anything else to add that uh, is important to remember um, as a recruit? Th- thanks so much for having us on. I, I think there's a lot of good information. You can see that how we recruit, how SLU recruits, how Yale recruits, they're all really different uh in their own unique way and so educating yourself Mm -hmm. is really important drew gave a really good outline of what his expectations are there and what he's looking for and so it's important to understand that uh as a as a player that's interested and that's why being seen by these coaches at you need to play against the best competition you can possibly play at or you know attend a specific id camp where you know that coach is going to be there and that you get constructive feedback. I, I think that's cool. Drew, did I miss anything that needs to be thrown in there? No, I think it's been a, it's been a great chat and super good to connect with with Emmett um, and Jack, who I'm appreciative of their uh, of their knowledge and, and skills to kind of learn and take a bit from each of them um, on, on my own path. So I consider them both great friends and colleagues and I'm absolutely thrilled that we were all kind of able to, to sit down and, and have a chat about it. Yeah. I really appreciate you guys making the time and Jack too, obviously. Um, I think it's super valuable information for kids and families who are listening to this. So uh, hopefully it also makes your jobs easier if they're listening to this and, and can avoid some of the pitfalls. So um, I appreciate it. And um We'll uh, go ahead and hit stop.